Hello, my name is Dr. Tyronda Elliott. I am an attending physician here at Highland Hospital in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine. Today, I will be reviewing oxygen delivery devices. My objectives are twofold. First, to review oxygenation goals, and second, to review the different types and the features of the oxygen delivery devices that we have here in the acute care setting. We should first start by reminding ourselves that oxygen is indeed a therapy. Supplemental oxygen is valuable in many clinical situations. However, excessive or inappropriate supplemental oxygen can be deleterious, contributing to higher mortality. The patients who are most at risk for oxygen toxicity are patients that have chronic lung disease and chronic hypercapnia. This concept of hyperoxia or oxygen toxicity is not clearly defined, but it's loosely thought of as significant elevations of the partial arterial pressure of oxygen. Hyperoxia appears to produce cellular injury through increased production of reactive oxygen intermediates, or ROIs. When the production of these ROIs increase and the cells and the oxygen defenses are depleted, they can react and impair the function of the essential intracellular macromolecules resulting in cell death. ROIs can also promote an inflammatory response. According to human and animal studies, high concentrations of inspired oxygen can cause a spectrum of lung injury, ranging from abruptive atelectasis, accentuation of hypercapnia, and also airway and parenchymal injuries such as tracheobronchitis, all the way to diffuse alveolar damage. What are the oxygenation goals for our patients? We should aim for low normal normoxia. The FiO2 should be titrated to the lowest concentration required to meet oxygenation goals. In our practice, we ideally aim for arterial oxygen, oxygen tension, or PaO2, between 60 and 70 millimeters of mercury and the peripheral oxygen saturation between 90 and 96%. Further increases in the PaO2 adds relatively little to the oxygen content of the blood. I need to underscore that clinical judgment should always prevail when we are selecting target oxygen saturations for an individual patient. Patients that have coronary artery disease or pulmonary hypertension, for example, may not tolerate hypoxemia as well. In addition, folks that have COPD, ARDS, or some of our post-arrest patients will also have different oxygenation goals. So again, although we aim for a low normal normoxia, we should always use our clinical judgment that will ultimately dictate and define what the individual oxygen saturation goals are for particular patients. The oxygen ICU trial was from JAMA 2016 and assessed the effect of conservative versus conventional oxygen therapy on mortality in patients who were admitted to the ICU. The plan was for about 660 patients, but the trial was stopped early after the hospital in Italy suffered damages related to an earthquake. So, the results have to be taken with a grain of salt. But essentially, patients were randomized to either receive oxygen to maintain low normoxic values versus high normoxia values, defined as 94 to 98% versus 97 to 100%. Patients that had either COPD exacerbations or ARDS were excluded from the trial. Again, the trial was stopped early, but interim analysis showed a surprisingly large signal. In patients that had low normoxia values, there was almost a 9% absolute risk reduction for ICU mortality. And also, many of these patients in this arm of the trial survived the hospital discharge. Here in the center of the screen, we see the Kaplan-Meier curves of the conventional oxygen therapy group versus the conservative oxygen therapy group. And clearly we see that the probability of survival was much higher in those that had oxygen saturations between 94 and 97. 
This is not a conclusive study by any stretch of the imagination. The groups were in balance, the study was underpowered due to low enrollment, and also the strict intention to treat analysis was not followed. But there is surmounting evidence that there is possible harm from high normal or supernormal arterial oxygen levels and the apparent absence of harm from low normal oxygenation. So it seems prudent for us to aim for O2SAT in the mid-90s for most critically ill patients. Here we have a chart of the different types of oxygen delivery devices that we'll be using in the acute care setting. We'll review five different devices. This chart outlines the reservoir capacity, the flow rate in liters per minute, and also the fraction of inspired oxygen that each of these devices can potentially provide. Nasal cannula. We're very familiar with this device. The reservoir capacity is minimal. The flow rate is about one to six liters per minute. And the FiO2 is calculated by adding about 3% FiO2 per liter flow per minute. So for example, if a patient is on five liters per minute of nasal cannula, what's the corresponding FiO2? Ambient air has an FiO2 of 21%. So if they're on five liters per minute, five liters times 3% FiO2 per liter equals an additional 15% FiO2. So 15 plus 21 equals an FiO2 of about 36%. Keep in mind this simple proportion when you're assessing the FiO2 in patients on nasal cannula. Let's go forward and talk about each of these individually. The oximizer. So this is a special oxygen cannula that has a higher luminal diameter than simple nasal cannula, but also has an incorporated oxygen reservoir that will provide a higher oxygen content. Sometimes this is used in the hospital. More often it's used in patients that have chronic lung disease and require long-term oxygen therapy. On the far left, we see an illustration of what the device will look like. You have the nasal prongs, the oximizer face piece, and the additional tubing. In the center panel, this is what a patient would essentially look like if they were wearing an oximizer device. The concept is essentially that the FiO2 will be higher given that the reservoir or the mustache is 100% oxygen, as opposed to simple nasal cannula where there is no reservoir and with inhalation, the patient can be in training ambient air of an FiO2 of 21%. On the far right, we have an oximizer that has the pendant or necklace as the oxygen reservoir. And this is the necklace that we use often, again, in patients that have long-term oxygen therapy. The Venturi mask has an adjustable flow rate. Flow rates between four and 12 liters per minute. The FiO2 is also adjustable, 24 to 60% FiO2. This mask covers both the nose and the mouth and can deliver higher levels of oxygen compared to the simple nasal cannula. Here you have a simple mask connected to oxygen tubing, that long cylinder, connected to the Venturi piece. The Venturi pieces are different colors and works off the Venturi principle where each colored piece has a different orifice size and each orifice size will then vary the flow. Hence, you can have precise adjustments in the flow rate and the FiO2. For example, the orange Venturi piece that's attached to this oxygen tubing that we see has FiO2 of 50%. Next, we have the simple mask. The simple mask is for patients who are spontaneously breathing who require even a higher FiO2. The flow rate is between six and 10 liters per minute, FiO2 corresponding to about 40 to 60%. There is no reservoir bag of oxygen. The reservoir is contained in the face mask volume of about 200 cc's. This simple mask is actually very good for mouth breathers. The downside is that it does not provide humidity. So patients can have a dry nares or epistaxis as a result of having this mask on for too long. So it should be often used in a short-term setting. The oxygen concentration is dependent upon the amount of ambient air that's mixing with the oxygen that the patient is breathing. 
This amount of mixing is determined by the fit of the mask and also by the patient's work of breathing. The non-rebreather. So this mask is used for moderate to severe respiratory distress. There is a one liter reservoir bag attached to the mask and this bag should be inflated. To achieve inflation, the flow rate should be at minimum 10 to 15 liters per minute. The corresponding FiO2 that this bag will deliver is 90 to 100 percent. There are a couple of one-way valves included on this mask. The first valve is between the mask and the bag. This valve allows the patient to only inhale oxygen from the bag. As the patient inhales, the valve opens. As the patient exhales, the valve closes. The second valve is located on the patient's right. It's sort of a clear or a cream colored disc over the right part of the mask. Now this exhale port is also a one-way valve and it opens when the patient exhales. If the valve between the mask and the bag becomes obstructed, there's risk of suffocation. Patients should be observed pretty closely when they're using a non-rebreather mask. High-flow nasal cannula comes in two main flavors, either the vapotherm system or the OptiFlow. Here at Highland, we actually use the vapotherm system. This is a mask-free system, and with adequate heat and humidification, oxygen can be employed relatively comfortably at very high flow rates on the order of 60 liters per minute, and an FiO2 of 100% can be delivered, all to the nares. You can see the system on the right, and essentially, there's two main things that we control, that we can control, which are the liter flow rate pictured in white or the FiO2 pictured in green. To adjust these settings, you simply press that blue center knob and dial in the numbers that you want to achieve the target peripheral saturation on your patient. In addition, high flow actually creates positive inexpiratory pressure or PEEP and also recruits inexpiratory lung volume. It's estimated that for every 10 liters per minute of oxygen flow applied, that you can generate 0.7 centimeters of water of PEEP when the mouth is closed. If the mouth is open, that volume falls to about 0.35 centimeters of water for each 10 liters of flow. The recruitment of lung with high flow undoubtedly contributes to the improved P to F ratios in patients that have hypoxemic respiratory failure. High flow is not directly indicated in patients with hypercapnic respiratory failure, but does reduce wasted ventilation or the alveolar dead space fraction, which can ultimately reduce the PaCO2. In addition, high flow improves the work of breathing. Patients in extremis will have increased oxygen consumption, thus increased carbon dioxide production. All investigations reveal that high flow improves the respiratory rate by lowering wasted ventilation and decreasing the anatomical dead space fraction by washing out nasopharyngeal nitrogen. So, high flow nasal cannula is indicated in hypoxemic respiratory failure, but not hypercapnic respiratory failure. The Ferrari trial was a multi center RCT published in New England Journal in 2015, where authors randomized about 310 patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure at multiple ICUs throughout France and Belgium. The patients were randomized to either receive non-invasive ventilation, or NIV, versus high flow by nasal cannula versus oxygen by face mask. They looked at the proportion of patients who were intubated. They also evaluated all-cause mortality at 90 days. A couple of more details about the Ferrari trial is that about 80 to 90 percent of patients who were enrolled, their hypoxemia was due to pneumonia, and most all of these patients had a PCO2 level less than 45 at enrollment. Their primary outcome was the rate of intubation. In folks that had a PDF ratio of less than 300, there was no statistical significance in terms of the intubation rates between the three arms of the trial. The advantages of high flow nasal cannula appear greatest in the most hypoxemic patients with a PDF ratio of less than or equal to 200. 
Looking at the figure on the right, the Kaplan-Meier curve clearly demonstrates that the cumulative incidence of intubation was much lower in the arm of patients who underwent oxygen therapy via high-flow nasal cannula. Only 30% of these patients actually required intubation, whereas in the non-invasive group or the oxygen group by face mask, their intubation rate was upwards of 55%. At 90 days, those receiving hypo-nasal cannula oxygen were actually twice as likely to survive as those receiving either face mask oxygen or, or non-invasive ventilation. Patients receiving NIV had the highest mortality at 25% versus 11% of those assigned to hypo oxygen by nasal cannula. The thought being that the higher mortality was associated with NIV due to delayed intubations or the incidence of volume-induced lung injury. I hope you found this review helpful. I'll conclude with these things. Oxygen is a therapy. We should always be using the lowest FiO2 required to maintain oxygen saturation to prevent hyperoxia and oxygen toxicity. Low normal normoxia is preferred and defined as a peripheral SAT of 90 to 96%. Again, with those caveats that I talked about earlier, remembering that your clinical judgment will always prevail when defining oxygen saturations. There are several oxygen delivery devices that I reviewed, namely nasal cannula, oxymizer, venturi mask, simple mask, non-rebreather. And last, high flow nasal cannula is indicated in non-hypercarbon hypoxemic respiratory failure. High flow nasal cannula provides PEEP, it reduces death space ventilation, and is comfortable. Thank you.